with Nick Lewin and Sean Ross. This week's special guest is the world's greatest mind reader, Max Maven. Welcome to the Entertainment Files. I'm Nick Lewin. And I'm Sean Ross. Well, today we have a guest who is very special. He is one of the most unusual men in the world. Orson Welles, who knew a great deal about magic, described him as the most original thinker in all of magic. Audiences around the world have acclaimed him as the world's greatest mind reader. He does some amazing things. He's promised to do a few of them live for us right here on the show, so we're excited to see that. That's our very special guest, Max Maven. Plus, we're going to have trivia and video picks, and if you take a look at your screen right now, you'll see the trivia question. Then we're going to come back with the answer and much, much more all coming up on the Entertainment Files, so be sure to stay with us. Welcome back to the Entertainment Files. Well, our guest today is unique, and I really mean that. There are many magicians in the world. There are quite a few mind readers, but there is only one Max Maven. Muhammad Ali said, this man is dangerous, and you're going to know that too in a moment. He is a fabulous psychological entertainer, something you may never have seen before, and he's right here. Thank you for being here, Nice Max. to see you. Thanks for being here, Max. Pleasure. Listen, I want to ask you, uh, Caesar's Magical Empire, I mean, this is really more than a show. I went there, and and it's an event, it's an experience, and I wanted to, uh, to tell everybody what you do in the Caesar's Magical Empire. Well, I'm having a terrific time there because I get to work in what they call the Sultan's Palace, which is a very elaborate theater that seats about 150, so it's intimate and at the same time rather lavish. Uh, but the place also, as you know from your experience, has a whole experience going through the, the meal with the wizards and the fire show. It, it, I want to live there. <laughs> it's a, a great, you're going to enjoy yeah. it through, I know, when it's a great spot. And you now, how do you describe what you do? I try to give my best uh, description, well, but it's not an easy thing. Yeah, it's not. I'm a psych psychological entertainer kind of sums it up. What I, what I do, in a sense, is magic without the tricks. I leave the sleight of hand to people like you, Nick. That's right. And, that's, uh, what I, that's what intrigues me about Women do not get do. sawn in half in my show. <laughs> nobody, nobody levitates. Uh, but hopefully, through the use of psychology, through the use of nonverbal communication, communication skills and intuition, I'm able to create things that are mysterious and surprising and fun. That now, now, you started off doing very different things from this. Your background in show business was so varied. It amazes me that of all those things, did you learn a little bit of something? You, you Give us a few of the things. Well, I was, I was a disc jockey at one point. I, I was, uh, I've been a writer in various uh, formats. Uh, I've had a chance to, to be a teacher. I, I've done a lot of different things. And of course, every experience one has, one brings to the next stage in one's life. And uh, the, the psychological entertainment thing I've been doing now for about 20 years. And uh, it just felt right. That's right. Now, Jeff McBride was saying, I liked his description. He said, if you, if you look at the metaphysical side of magic, you start off as the trickster uh, and you're fooling people. Then you move into the point where you want to have that pure sleight of hand. And he put it so neatly, he said, eventually, of course, when you reach that level of uh, evolution, you want to become a mind reader because there are no tricks. You've transcended <laughs> that. Is that about right? I would say so. At least in, in my case, I, I tried to find the area of mystery that appealed most to me and then to go ahead and share that with the audience. Albert Einstein once said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. And if that's true, then I do a beautiful act. That's right. That's right, you really do. You know, from what I'm hearing is uh, these are skills and abilities that you weren't born with. You've cultivated and developed these. Uh, well, I think, they're, I think they're innate abilities that everybody has, uh -huh. Sean, but most people don't do anything with them. Right. Uh, you know, most people have musical ability, but not everybody works at it to become a musician. And in the same way, we all use nonverbal communication techniques in our day-to-day -day communication uh, with the people around us, but we don't necessarily work on developing them, building them up, and refining them. You know, as an outside observer of the work both of you do, you see a rise in popularity of this kind of thing. People's interest really has peaked lately. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. First of all, things just go in cycles. Mm -hmm. You know, magic goes up and down, and a different type of music goes up and down, or fashions change, and, and so forth. So some of it is just sort of a, a rhythm that, that nobody can quite identify. But I think part of it also is that we're heading for the end of the century. Yes. And for that matter, the, the end of the millennium. And, and people, when you hit that uh, end of a century, they tend to get a bit more mystical because there's a time where you're about to enter a whole new era. 
and it makes people start considering the world around them. And the minute you start really looking at the world around you, you start realizing how strange and mysterious it really is. We, we tend to take stuff for granted. Uh, but I think the fact of hitting the end of the century reminds us that it's a spookier world than we realize. And there's an upcoming uh, documentary, I believe it's a PBS, called The Art of Magic. I know you're involved with that. Uh, would you mention a little bit about Well, what this is a, a, a show that uh, is, it, it's, it's waiting to be aired. It'll be on in uh, February of, of 98. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we attempted to do with this show, on which I was uh, an advisor as, as well as uh, an on-air performer, is to explore, as you would expect from PBS, to explore the, the philosophical, the cultural, the sociological, the anthropological aspects of magic and mystery entertainment. Uh, some of the guests that you've had on your show, uh, Jeff McBride, Lance Burton, are on this show as well, and uh, you get a chance to see them not only performing, but also talking about what they do. Well, there's something that's always amazed me. I talk for a living. That's all I do. You talk a lot, too. But you have taken what you do and made it an international art form. You've had series in Taiwan. You have been seen on television in countries that talk performers like me have no hope of ever going to. How have you done that? And what well, is it's, it that it's, made that work? It's been one of my great uh, pleasures that my work has taken me around the world. And I do get to work in markets where talk acts don't normally get to go. Uh, and it varies from one situation to another. In some countries, uh, I have to work with a translator. Uh, in Taiwan, for example, I don't speak Mandarin Chinese. I did a 13-part series uh, in Taiwan, all done with a translator. Uh, and that was very difficult because the timing, of course, was, was thrown to the wind. Uh, in other countries, Japan, for example, well, I speak Japanese. So uh, I've had a chance to host eight network specials in Japan working in the native language. Uh, other places, such as, say, uh, when I work in Sweden or Norway, uh, the linguistic ability of the local population is such that I can work in English and most people will follow. That's interesting. Well, I'd said to Max, uh, could you give us a clip? And we had clips we could have shown you in the upcoming uh, World's Greatest Magic Part 4. You've done many things. And he said, no. He said, what I do, let me do it live. And I, I'm sure there are people out there who are saying, well, who is this guy? Why is he dressed like that? And what does he really do? Could you give us a little I'm going to do exactly that. And uh, you've actually set the table for me, as I did. it were. I put this stool uh, here. But, but in conceptual terms, you've set the table by bringing up this issue of international uh, travel, because that's the topic for this afternoon, or I should say later tonight when, when this airs. Uh, Sean, we're going to try this with you because right. we just met today for the first time. That's right. And did. so quite clearly, uh, we're not in cahoots. Actually, we're in a little television studio in Las Vegas. Uh, <laughs> these are, are pictures from around the world. And, and the task of the game at first is for you to identify what countries we're talking about. Oh, boy. I'm now, do you recognize this one? I started off with a, with a kind of Mahal. tough one. No, that's, that's a, a Russian look, domain. That's very oh, good. This is, this is the, the, the red square in Russia. Exactly that. This one should be easier. Oh, what, what country would that be? Australia, the kangaroo. Easy to do. And this one? Ah, uh, Paris. That France. would be France, exactly right. that. Uh, Nick, you should oh, uh, probably recognize that one. this That's one. England. That's England. England. There's, there's Big Ben, of course. Holland. Matt, I tricked you. Uh, actually, this is the Netherlands. Ooh, See, they don't Holland. call it Holland over there, but, but you're right. I mean, it's the same country. They just use a different name. And finally, this one might, might throw you. What would that represent? The yin and the yang. Right. Which would be which country? Uh, China. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm going to give these over to you and ask you to mix them up. Sean, mix them thoroughly and set them down on the table. Face down? Face up. Face, Face up. up. Okay. That's the, and give them a cut. And you may cut them again if you wish. The, the okay. choice is entirely yours. I think one yours. is enough. All I right. felt good about we, that. We've got the cards now in an order that you chose. Yes. I'm going to start moving them one by one. And whenever you like, you just simply say, Max, stop. Max, stop. Okay. Now, I can't be more fair than that. You stopped me on France. Yes. If you had waited a little longer, it would have been Australia. Gone to if Australia. you jumped the gun, it would have been uh, China. You stopped me on France. Yes, I did. Can we be more fair than that? No. And yet, Sean, I'm telling you right now, I knew you were going to stop me on France. Okay. And I can prove it, because I have a prediction. And the prediction is that on the back of the very card you stopped me is an F for France. Yes. <laughs> I don't think that works. Wait a minute. Nick, you're being skeptical because you have a feeling there are probably letters on all of the cards. I do. And, well, you're right. There's an A for Australia. Uh, there's an R for Russia. Uh, there's a, an N for Netherlands. There's an E for England and a C for China. However, they do happen to spell out the word France. Yes, they do. <laughs> Very wow. good. I love that. 
<laughs> that's that's your form of mind control. There's a lot of control going well, on, isn't it? Obviously, there? what I had to I do in this that. situation was to get you to say stop as I had that France card in my hand and to use psychology to do it. Uh, the rest of it is using theater to hopefully build up a situation that is surprising, that has a little sting in its tail, that, that somehow takes it into more than simply, well, I got it right, what's next? But I felt like I could say stop at any time. I, I didn't feel that control. It's interesting how that happened. That is the art of Max That's the Maven. art. Uh, and I've seen you. I've seen you at moments when there was an electricity, particularly with this one-on-one -on -one thing that is very special. You know, we're going to have to take a break now, but we're going to come back. We're going to hit you up for your movie picks, and hopefully, you'll do a little bit more of this for us. This amazing mind reading with Max Maven. We're going to be back with more entertainment files following these messages. Welcome back to the Entertainment Files. We're talking with the most famous mind reader in the world, Max Maven. That's right. You know, I have to mention something. Max is well known around the world, not just to audiences, but to magicians. And he's had series of whole videotapes, ideas, and these unorthodox uh, psychological principles that he's come up with are eagerly sought after by magicians around the world. And uh, you have a following. How many books have you written just on original ideas? Oh, to be, to be honest, I've lost count, Nick. I know. But, uh, it is one of my pleasures to come up with uh, ideas for magic, particularly because what I do is in a very specific and, and defined range. You know, I don't saw ladies in half. I don't uh, uh, float things in the air. But those magicians who do that sort of thing can use psychological techniques to enhance what they do. And for that reason, I've been fortunate enough to be in a position to uh, be a consultant to, to Siegfried and Roy, David Copperfield, Lance Burton, uh, Penn and Teller, and many others uh, on their work in, in helping to give a little extra psychological edge, perhaps, to what it is they're doing. Uh, so in that way, it, it gets me the opportunity, uh, if I ever have had the urge to, to, you know, saw that lady in half, well, I can get involved in those shows to some degree. That's right. How about just one more demonstration? We want to talk movies with you, too, because that's one of our other big loves. But how about just one more quick demonstration? All right, we'll do a real quickie. Uh, and we'll do this with Sean again because nobody trusts exactly. you, Nick. These are, these are what are called ESP testing symbols. They were devised almost a century ago at Duke University. And there are five of them. Standard symbols. Uh, a circle. Mm -hmm. A square. Three wavy lines. A plus sign. And a star. Very easy to concentrate upon. You wouldn't get any mistakes in confusing one for another. You take them and mix them up. Sure. And in the um, traditional phrase, pick a card, any card. Now, there are only five of them. But take one, look at it, Sean, but don't show it to the camera, don't show it to Nick, certainly don't show it to me, okay. slip it back. Only I can see it. Right. Coming back And mix them, you better mix them again, because with only five, it's too easy you to keep track of You bet I will. Them. Now, you notice there's They're an all-over back pattern of, of little tiny dots uh, yes. on the back. That's uh, to make it very difficult to mark the cards. Now, I'm being honest with you here. I said very difficult. I didn't say impossible. The cards could be marked. Uh -huh. But it would be a very difficult system to do so, and they're not. And in fact, I'll let you keep these just to prove the point. They're not marked. One of them is being thought of by you. I'm going to try to get the, uh, the impression of which one you are thinking of. Okay. And I'm going to do it this way. Let me fan the cards out so that each card, is, each symbol is exposed at least a little bit. So that you can see where yours is, I hope. I can see them all, yes. All right. Look at me. Look at the designs. Look back at me. Thank you very much. Now we're down to four. Keep looking at me. No down to the designs, up to me. That's good. Now we're down to three. Easy enough. Now we're down to two. Look back and forth. Noah, look at me. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that's scary a little. I find it slightly frightening, actually. That is great. <laughs> and, and again, so theatrical. I'm watching cards flicking around. Well. Not just the idea. You, do you have a theater background? When I was quite young in, in high school and, and college, uh, I, I took part in, in a number of plays. I've had the chance to do some acting on TV as well. Uh, some years back, I did an episode of Mork and Mindy that shows up in reruns. And mo right. more recently, I was on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, 
uh, where I played, of all things, a hypnotist. So, uh, so it wasn't that much of an acting stretch. That's it, and that, which sort of brings us to movies. Uh, we have this little deal we do on the show. You better explain it, Sean. That's right. If you were stranded on a desert island, you could <laughs> only bring five movies, assuming a VCR and TV is there. What five would they be? And of course, Nick and I love the guilty pleasures. <laughs> 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 well, uh, you, you did warn me about this question, but, but not very far in advance, uh -huh. so I have not had a chance to, uh, to go and, and dig through my film library. I do have a, a, a a fairly good uh, print library of books on film because I'm a, I'm a film buff uh, of sorts. Uh, so this really is off the top of my head. Uh, the first two are easy. Uh, my favorite movie of all time and the runner-up are very easy. The, my favorite movie is All About Eve. Oh. Uh, Joseph Mankiewicz directed and wrote uh, a, just a beautiful script. Uh, these days, particularly, scripts seem to have fallen by the wayside. That's right. Uh, that's but right. the script is so beautifully composed, the lines, the dialogue, and the, and the cast is exquisite. Uh, as proven by the fact that when the movie came out in 1950, I think it was, uh, it swept the Oscars in, in the acting category. That's right. Uh, so uh, Betty Davis and George Sanders, it, it's just a marvelous uh, film, and, and I could watch that over and over and have. So that's my number one. Uh, almost tied for that in the number two slot, I would say The Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, oh, Elsa Manchester. Uh, yeah. Uh, James Whale directed this, and of course, the first time around, it was kind of a serious movie. For the sequel, uh, he, he put in some humor. Now, a critic once wrote about me that I was perfectly balanced between humorous and hair-raising. And I've always <laughs> loved that comment about me, and that's probably why I like this movie so much, because it is perfectly balanced yes. in that way. Uh, Ernest Thesiger, who plays Dr. Pretorius, uh, is, is just a wonderfully funny camp actor uh, with some great lines, and, and the combination of some genuinely scary, spooky stuff and some really arch, funny stuff is a beautiful mix. That's nice, and that's part of what leavens your work, because it's interesting, almost a dichotomy there. You've got a horror movie, you've got a great theater story, but there's that comedy, which really does take the edge of what you do. It's interesting. What's, uh, what? Now, those are the now two we big get, ones. Now we now. can start getting difficult. Uh, in third place, I would have to put something by Alfred Hitchcock, because he's just so good. It's hard he's to do, wonderful. though, isn't it? Pick, pick uh, in thinking through all of Hitchcock's movies, because they are so good, and, and each one has something uh, to, to grab you. Foreign Correspondent, which is one of That's his early ones, yes. er, early from what, after he came to the U.S. Uh, there's just something about the structure of the movie. It, it keeps yanking you around corners you don't expect. Uh, visually, it's one of his more interesting movies, and, and that's one of uh, my favorites. I'll, I'll place that third. Fourth, uh, I would put uh, the only more recent movie, uh, and even this one isn't that recent, but the only color one on the list, <laughs> would be uh, Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West. Ooh, oh. wonderful movie. Uh, a real epic. Uh, it really is. And it's, it's very stylized, and some of Leone's work doesn't hold up as well as others, but this one, for me, just works every time. It grabs me. I was asked, and, once, and, uh, I was yeah. asked once who one of my favorite villains in a movie was, and of course, Henry Fonda. And what a brilliant that. piece of casting really to have taken Henry Fonda, who is everybody's you know, always the nice guy. But he was truly uh, frightening in that film. Yes, he was. That's, he was. And in fifth place, I have to put Citizen Kane because everybody does. Well. It, is, it is absolutely <laughs> one of the all-time great movies. Uh, you can learn more about filmmaking from watching that than probably any other film. So that rounds out the five. Is there a movie you've seen, uh, getting back to the guilty pleasure, that uh, maybe you know it was a bad movie, but you've watched it a few times? Yeah, I'll tell you a movie that, that is my guilty pleasure, although it's actually in some ways a very good movie. A uh, film from 1953, I believe it was, called Invaders from Mars. Ooh, that was. Oh, yeah. When I was a kid, and saw this, I watched it on Saturday morning TV, bright light in the living room, <laughs> and I was scared to death. Scariest movie I've ever seen. W uh, William Cameron Menzies is the guy who designed the movie, and if you actually go back and look at it, as hokey as it is, uh, from, a, from a point of view of composing frame, uh, the look of the movie is superb, and the sets are built on slightly false perspective, and uh, it really works. It's a it's a great paranoid adventure. It's a great it movie, was. and it was remade Super at one movie. time. But the yet, remake people didn't, have didn't to see the original. That's the remake right. uh, had added was fun, but it, nothing to compare to the I, original. And I have to just jump in. Once upon a time in America, Sergio Leone's uh, final movie, his taking of that Western myth and placing it into the gangster context. Did you enjoy that? You know what? I was very disappointed by that. You were. I thought it had incredible moments, but I thought it didn't come together. And, and uh, I, I can't tell you how much I was looking forward to that movie. Mm -hmm. well, perhaps of course, it was re-edited right. uh, by someone the, other than Leone. You saw the long If version. I saw the original 
Yeah. If I saw the original edit, I might have a different opinion. That's right. It was they 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 butchered it. They put they it did. in that consecutive time. And yeah. but you know we're gonna have to take a break. Would you hang in there? We're gonna Absolutely. do some video pics on this uh, psychic mind reading area that you might go out and rent. So hang in there. Stay with us. We're gonna be right back with more entertainment files after these messages. Welcome back to the Entertainment Files. Well, you can see the question on the screen was who portrayed the telekinetic teen in the film Carrie? And of course, the answer to that is Sissy Spacek. And if you take a look at that film again, Carrie, notice a very young John Travolta in it. It's a great movie directed by Brian De Palma, written by Stephen King. And it's hard to believe that this movie, for a while, was turned into a stage musical. That's right. And as uh, Max Maven just pointed out, it was a bit of a bomb, <laughs> which isn't surprising when you look at it. But I, I loved that movie. In fact, it reminds me of another Brian De Palma, my favorite of his uh, cult movies, Phantom of the Paradise, and Sissy Spacecheck was the set designer. That good that. trivia in there. A little bit of trivia yeah. there. But I, I've got some picks. I love this feel, that mind reading, the, uh, the telepath, telep, telep, what's the word, Max? Telepathic. Telepathic, that's right. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm not psychic. I come from a family of psychotics. But... <laughs> <laughs> my favorite, my absolute favorite, was a 1947 movie, Nightmare Alley, with Tyrone Powell and Joan Blondell, and it's terrific. He's a psychic, and he's for real, and it's a gritty movie. It comes from the pen of William Lindsay Gresham, a great writer. Well, I've got another good pick, too. Another Brian De Palma film. He's the great at doing this. The film The Fury, again, about uh, telekinetic powers. It had Kirk, Kirk Douglas in it, John Cassavetes. If you haven't seen it in a while, check it out again. It had a bad rap in 1978, but it's a good film. How about you, Max? How about one in that sort of a psychic area? I'll tell you the movie that is the most mystically inclined movie I've ever seen in terms of just giving you the feeling of being in a supernatural environment. And that's a film called The Last Wave. Oh, Peter oh, Weir, right. Australia. Yes. Richard, uh, Chamberlain. Richard Chamberlain, exactly. Excellent. And perhaps it's because when we see films about uh, Western mysticism, we're used to all the cliches. Mm -hmm. but, but this film has to do with Australian Aboriginal mysticism. And it's, it's uncharted territory, at least for me, and for most, most Americans. So it is a very, very heavy experience and really terrific going. And very I'm happy powerful. to say it's on video now. For a while it wasn't, but it is out there, so people should check it out. Trima and you talked earlier about that end of the millennium, that those changes that come into being and movies like that are about that not only about it but they help make those changes mentally within the people I think mm -hmm. they're really there to let you know what's coming up and happening next well this has been wonderful thank you very much for joining oh, us oh it's and been my pleasure if you have a chance to go out to see Max Maven live go it is an experience you will never forget he's also an author he's written some wonderful books the, the ultimate book on fortune telling and it's called uh, Max Maven's book on fortune telling what else it's a great book and it's Prentice Hall and right. it's still very available. He's had CD-ROMs, videotapes. No matter what it is, when Max Maven is involved, you know there is going to be a psychological impact that is going to hit you on the head. Thank you for joining us, Max. My pleasure. It has oh, been thanks, wonderful. Max. It was fun and frightening at times. <laughs> Absolutely. And we <laughs> hope you'll job. come back again. And we hope you'll come back again, too. And join us next week for some more Entertainment Files. <laughs>